and James A. Lindsay. Uh, James A. Lindsay is the author of a fantastic book called Dot 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 Infinity Plus God Equals Folly, a book that I was lucky enough to edit, and the foreword was written by uh, the late Victor Stenger. So, first of all, James, hello, and would you like to introduce yourself uh, to those who will not know you or do not know you? <laughs> That's sort of an open-ended thing. Uh, and yes, first, hello, and um, let's see. My name, I guess you already said, is you know James A. Lindsay, and I've written the book dot 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 Infinity plus God equals Folly. I also wrote a year and a half or so before that a book called God Doesn't We Do. Um, only humans can solve human challenges, and um, I'm a you know I'm a mathematician by training. I have turned most of my attention to the question about you know, God's role in society, God's existence and whatnot. And so I get accused a lot of being a philosopher now. I don't know how I feel about that, but my training at least is in mathematics and physics. Um, and my formal education is. Can, can I just say for, for the book, there's nothing wrong with philosophy. It's, it's awesome, obviously. Obviously. Yeah. I mean, it's um, just, just branding. So so um, the the book, which can I just say is here and looks fantastic, and it's a great book. It's been out about a year now. Um, so what 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 was the story that got you into writing the book? Well, you know, like I said, I started maybe in 2010 or so, getting really interested in. I mean, it's, it's an older interest than that, but the, the questions about you know, God's existence, God's role in society, um, or what that actually means, given that I don't think that there is a God, uh, that kind of you know goes back to about 2010 that I started becoming an active voice about it. And then since my training's in mathematics, um, people wanted to know a lot of different things. I'd get asked questions, you know, we hear things like, you know, our God is an infinite God all the time. And some other theologians have written a great deal about God and infinity and what that means. And so I figured, well, I'll write some stuff about it, some blog posts about it. And I developed some ideas there and got enough of them at one point where I decided that maybe it would be better if I just kind of turned it into a book. And so that's sort of what led to writing the, the book that you held up just a second ago. Yeah. So so um, uh, I came along into the process at some point, and uh, at that time it was a selection of blog posts, and the idea was to to turn this into a more coherent project with a theme sort of uh, going through the book. So what what is the theme that, that, that runs through the book then? It's funny that if you would have asked me this question at different times during the process, I think I would have given you different answers. I think the answer I would have given you at the time is that infinity is weird and easy to misuse, especially where, where it intersects with philosophy. But now I think I would argue that the real thrust of the book is that infinity is pretty much the best tool that we have, or maybe not the best one, a really great tool that we have for realizing the fact that how we make sense of pretty much everything in the world comes down to our assumptions or our presumptions about it, which, you know, in mathematics we call axioms. There's, that's a term used in philosophy as well. And in religion, it usually gets branded as presumptions, maybe because it's presumptuous, but uh, that would be, I guess, the main theme, that infinity is an excellent tool for us to realize that our philosophical worldviews, the way that we, we understand reality, is ultimately a mental construction. So um, one of the uh, the terms that you uh, use quite a lot in the book, which is a really good analogy, is, is not to confuse the map with the terrain. Um, can you explain that with regards to infinity and its application to God? Well, sure, and, and actually that's kind of exactly what I mean by the main thrust being um, that everything comes down to, to our presumptions. If we, we follow, our, if our worldview is built out of, out of how we interpret the world given various assumptions that we make about it, what that means is that we are dealing with something analogous to a map. Our, our cognitive model of the world is, is, is like a map 
and the world itself is the actual terrain, the universe that we, that we inhabit or are a part of is the actual terrain. And it's very easy to get confused and start to think that that mental models, or that mental model that we hold of the world, our worldview itself, is instead of being representative in some way of reality or hooked somehow to reality, that it is reality itself. And so that fundamental confusion, um, I think, has pretty much everything to do with with how people interpret a lot of the religious articles, especially where God comes into it. Uh, if they presume that there is some, we'll say for the sake of argument, uh, philosophical, philosophically defined entity, uh, maybe the, the god of classical theism or the god of some other definition of theism, whatever, and that explains various aspects of how the world works, why the world exists, and so on and so forth, then that gives them a lens, which in Christianity are often called Jesus-colored glasses, that gives them a lens through which they're going to see the world and be able to interpret their observations as, as evidence to, to support their worldview. And so that's sort of a big problem because it's, it's confusing the map, which is their... their theologically built um, mental construction of the world with the world itself. So they have this idea about how the world works, and then they project that thought onto reality. Um, in the book, you know, I've written, you read it, so you've read it probably more times than I have. Um, the, uh, I, used, I, used the, I made the remark that it's like having a map with a mountain drawn on it and then going to where the mountain is supposed to be and not finding one and then getting mad at the world that there's not one there. Um, that's the kind of central confusion that mistaking the map and the terrain kind of comes down to. And so what I really hope that the book helps people understand is that, you know, we have these mental models of the world. They do in some way hook to reality. That's what I think interested uh, Vic Stinger in the project in the first place is that that was a big line of thought for him uh, in, for the last several years of his life. Um, but our, our models hook to reality somehow, but it's very easy to forget, especially if they hook pretty well to reality, that ultimately we're talking about a model. And so I think, for instance, that theism is one such model that people use to understand the world. That means that God is an idea, not an entity, um, a philosophical construction, if you will. And um, they go on to mistake that construction for a part of, of, of reality. And that's sort of what I wanted to communicate with, with that line of thought in the book. So I, I, th I find it quite interesting that, that people like William Lane Craig, who use infinity or, or, or reference infinity in their arguments uh, for God, uh, often say there is no such thing as, as an actual infinity. Um, and then, because there's this difference between, for those who don't know, there's a difference between an actual and a potential infinity or, or an actual set of, infinite set of things. Uh, and infinity as it's used abstractly in mass as a kind of mathematical infinity. So the, there's these two different ideas of infinity and, and often there's an equivocation of, of those two terms and confusion ensues. So, but, but Craig states that there's no such thing as, as a, an actual infinity and I, I would personally would tend to agree with, with that. I mean we don't know that there is an, an actual infinite set of things right in existence but intuitively to me it seems problematic but but then so for Craig would say there's no such thing as an infinite set set of stuff but then we'll say that God is infinite and then as you know when when Craig is questioned on that he says well it's not a quantifiable uh, use of the term infinite it's more of a quality but as you state in the book those qualities are actually quantities really that they're actually those characteristics are quantifiable can you explain uh, something about the quantifiable characteristics of God with regard to infinity well so the the, the quality of 
of infinity is inherently quantitative is, is kind of the thing. Infinity refers explicitly to, um, doesn't exactly address the question of, but it sort of addresses the question of how many. And so you're immediately tied to the concept of quantity if you're going to start talking about infinity. So often potential infinity is described as this conceptual notion of limitlessness. Um, mathematicians or mathematical philosophers who consider themselves finitists, these are people who do not accept the axiom of infinity, which is to say that they don't, I guess we could say don't believe infinity exists. Um, mathematicians who are finitists use, instead of the word infinite, the phrase or the term indefinite. Uh, meaning indefined. I think this is a beautiful analogy to, to God and the fact that they like to tie infinity to God. Theologians often like to tie infinity to God gives us this kind of rich source of analogies there. We have this idea that maybe a better term since we don't know, we don't know if God exists, we don't know if the infinite exists, we maybe can't technically know in either case. Um, we're po probably dealing with unfalsifiable uh, statements about reality at that point. Um, so we have one analogy there. There's, there's no evidence, I don't think, that could convince us that the universe is infinite. And we can talk about why that is if you want at some point. And then we don't have any evidence that, that God exists. I, it's again, like I was just saying, this is comes back to we have certain, we make certain assumptions about the world, like, like God, and world. So infinity here, this is why infinity turns out to be such a great example of an idea that lets us see that this is, you know, it's kind of like the tear in the, in the matrix. It lets us see what's going on. It lets us see that, that we really do rely on assumptions. In this case with infinity, we're dealing with the, the axiom of infinity. So qualitative infinity is this idea that there's limitlessness. Limitlessness of what? Of quantity. So we're tied to the quantitative immediately. And then, can you, the, can you give a, a, an example of, of a sort of characteristic where this would be applied uh, with regard to God? Yeah, yeah, I can get to that. Um, God is often often characterized as being omniscient or omnipotent, and omni here typically refers to a, a quality of limitlessness. Although it's often explicitly said that it's it's infinite. You know, God is infinitely powerful. God could do anything. And so there are problems, there are, I mean, there are philosophical problems when we start trying to shoehorn infinity onto reality because, you know, if God is infinitely powerful, we have to ask questions like, well, could God create one more thing? And the answer has to be yes, because he's infinitely powerful. And could he create one more thing after that? Could he create one more thing after that? And it just continues to go on and on. So the question becomes, could, well, could could God create a limitless number of things, and it starts getting really awkward. And then if we start tying other properties like omnibenevolence, that's a lot of syllables, um, infinite goodness, the question kind of gets a little bit more pointed, like can God create another good thing? And the answer has to be yes. And could he create another good thing after that? And at some point, you know, does he maximize goodness? And if he maximizes goodness then he can't create another good thing by definition, but at the same time, he has to be able to create another good thing by definition. And so we have a, you know, kind of a philosophical train wreck between omnipotence and omnibenevolence at that point. Uh, omniscience, you can do the same thing. Does God know this, this fact or that fact? Does God know what all the prime numbers are? And, you know, Craig is, I don't really like to talk about Craig, but Craig insists God doesn't have propositional knowledge, but this is very bizarre because how God is posited to be as the, the judge of living and dead, so let's say he's judging me. Does God have knowledge of the proposition, you know, that James rejected me in life? It seems like in order to make a judgment, he has to have propositional knowledge of that kind. So now you're starting to parse out, does he have this kind of propositional knowledge or that kind? It starts to look very much like a like a total bullshit game at some point to just keep talking like you're you're like you're making intelligent 
sounding arguments about something. I think the philosopher's God often gets sort of ad hoc rationalized into this corner that God has to be like this, but then this means that God has to be like that. And in the end, it's so far removed from anything revealed in in something like the Bible or in people's personal lives that that it's just, just an intellectual pursuit without any kind of necessary, uh, you know, correlation with reality. Yeah. Right. I would argue, in fact, that people believe in God for completely non-philosophical reasons, and then the philosophy enters in order to protect whatever that set of reasons happens to be. Often, I think that they're they're either psychological or social. And uh, oh, absolutely. I was just doing a a podcast segment for a, for a, uh, a a podcast called Skeptical. Uh, and my my one uh, tonight that I did was on the just world theory, and uh, I was relating it back to something that happened with my partner in a kitchen. We we've got this big range oven, and uh, one our twin boys were on this wheelie chair and they smashed into the uh, the range oven on uh, along the kitchen floor and smashed the door. And we just got this new house and the, we inherited this massive oven, and it's ten years old and they don't make that part anymore. And so we were going to have to get like a whole new oven for like 1,300 quid. So then I Googled the part number and found like one on the internet and bought this. And my, and my partner, who's, who's not religious anymore, sat there and went, this had to have happened because, uh, because the, the oven was, was faulty and it was going to catch fire. And, and so there's this kind of rationalization that, that happened in a non-theistic person that made that unfair thing just. And I think that to me that summed up what's inside all of us, which is this desire for a just world. And I think uh, so many theists are have those kind of mechanisms working inside them. And then ev everything else, you know, all the rational arguments come afterwards. It's all just post hoc rationalization. But I, I think the just world theory is really, really powerful. Yeah, it's 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 extremely it's an extremely powerful idea. I like to get into this, you know, I don't really need to go into a lot of depth here, but I like to get into this with people about the notion of karma because it pulls them out of the the Christian mindset. But then at least I don't know how it is in Britain, but I'm betting it's similar. Um, kind of this like happy <laughs> friendly version or notion of what karma means has sort of taken taken over and everybody thinks oh well that guy was being a jerk when he was driving and he crashed his car that's karma and you know it's yeah. just that it's not exactly what karma means but in any case these are still different appeals to the just world theory whether we're talking about proper hindu karma which is fairly horrific if you study what that doctrine is all about or if we talk about this hippy dippy kind of new age westernized karma where it's just you know a sense that oh that guy's or this that woman's getting what's coming coming to him or her uh, that's all I think the I think the psychological need for for a sense of, of justice which would be actually speaking to a psychological need to overcome powerlessness if we want to talk about it in psychological themes uh, yeah. Well, you get, you get you get these common sense, uh, well, not uh, common nonsense uh, statements like you got what was coming to you, what goes around comes around, you reap right. what you sow, chickens come home to roost, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, mm -hmm. and I think you know it's just in it's in popular culture sort of mindsets that that it, and yet really if you sat down and and analyze what you're saying, I mean it's just complete bullshit. The universe doesn't give a shit whether whether. <laughs> Like your life is particularly fair in your opinion or not, you know. The rock falls on my head, like rock falls on my head. There you go. Everything happens for a reason, man. But but <laughs> but, but um, what's quite interesting is when you look at the uh, evolution of of Christianity in in the Old Testament time, there was no notion real realistically of heaven, hell, and and the eternal soul. These things developed in the intertestamental period, just after the sort of Hellenistic. Uh, Jews, these so Greek influenced Jews of the Seleucid Empire, were in charge of of things, right? And they were they were giving the the the, the other Jews loads of shit, and they were saying, why? What? Literally questioning why the good things, why the bad things happen to good people? We're the chosen ones. What is going on? You know, you can imagine the same conversations in Auschwitz, and and and. And it was then that they looked at the, the, the Greek 
who were who were influencing them, you know, the Greek civilization, and saw this idea of heaven and hell, and saw this idea of an eternal soul, where if bad things happen to you in life, it gets sort of uh, balanced in the afterlife, and that's when you get those core ideas. Now they end up being core Christian ideas, but they literally didn't exist in the Old Testament. So you know, there's this really weird. Uh, obvious evolution of ideas which we can map onto historical events in 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 that area a and yet somehow these things are like you know s stone cornerstones of, of Christian belief and yet it's just a case of well it gives you a just world you're right I think the idea that, that God is, is infinite could be mapped similarly to be honest with you I think God's likely in the beginning were just you know, powerful forces or entities, but you didn't need limitless power. In fact, you have stories about people trying to wage war on gods and or demigods, at least. And you know, That's a good point. Yeah. And I think it came down to you know, like the little the little childhood argument. You know, my dad can beat up your dad. Yeah, well, my dad's twice as strong as yours, and it just got bigger and bigger because it's all just abstract, and people can say whatever they want. But then again, also, if you're talking about just world, having a god that's infinitely capable is sort of what it seems to require in order to meet out justice at that at that scale, at the cosmic scale, the scale of everything. So I think you know all these ideas are definitely tied up together, um, pretty tightly, in fact. Yeah, I was trying to just flick through your book here to find there's a really good quote about how you know. Uh, how God was here, and then you know you looked there, and he wasn't there, and then God was as big, big as your village, and as big as your mountain. And then you look at the mountain, he's not there, and then you go up to space, and he's not there, and you know. It's a really yeah, I put something on Twitter the other day that has really kind of just bounced around in my head ever since. I put, it speaks to that same theme, and I put something like, you know, things humanity knows now. You know, one of the things is. Um, we can't see God from the moon either. And that's sort of, I mean, it's, I was, I think, inspired by the old saying that, you know, what is it, the, the quote, I forget who said it, so it's terrible, but, you know, when you get to the, when, when the people from the blue one got to the gray one, that's when God should have come out and said congratulations or whatever, that talking about the earth and the moon, and when we got to the moon, you know, the, the jig was up. But I was sort of, I think, in mind of that, and it, it just struck me, you know, we can't, we can't seem to find God from here unless, you know, we do completely banal things like talk about clouds or crepuscular rays or something. Just good luck sometimes. Um, but on the other hand, we can't see God from the moon either. We've been there. We've looked. All there was was, you know, rocks and dust and, and glaring sunlight and astronauts driving rovers like, like race car drivers and there weren't there weren't deities you know so it's it's i mean you you really do get to the situation where the god of the gaps is really what's going on in the world you know we're we're having worlds uh you know environmental catastrophe disease all the things that go on in in the world and have done for for time immemorial like you know wars religious wars what's going on in the Middle East, all of this crap going down, and yet God doesn't appear. He's been on 2,000-year holiday. Uh, and so all that's left is what? Maybe consciousness and, uh, I don't know, some other kind of areas of philosophy where God is just about, a, a, you know, a, a possible explanation. But even then, mm -hmm. it's just a, it's, a, it's an appeal to ignorance. So Right. Yeah, it's, you know, we keep we keep getting a bigger and bigger horizon that we can see out to and we keep not seeing God so theologians have to keep making God in a sense bigger and more abstract really in order to do yeah. that so you know, we moved him right outside that's what one of the things in that quote you're looking for is you know yeah. they moved him right outside the universe entirely well again like I said that makes me think that all that we're talking about is an idea a way that people conceive of the world and try to make sense of it and try to work with, with with, the, with what they're faced with. And again, we could talk about that in terms of psychology if you want. With the calamities you just mentioned, we're again talking about that same theme of human powerlessness and coping mechanisms in order to overcome those feelings. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, and a lot, of, a lot of good work has been done studying you know, that theme. The central 
thing I think that keeps a lot of people hooked on religion as it is has to do with death. That's kind of the big hard thing for for non-believers to try to win believers over with. Is it's, it's the ultimate unfair thing, isn't it? To go back to the just world theory, it's like the ultimate. That's not fair. You know, why does my life right. have to come to an end? Right. And and it's again, it's still that same theme of powerlessness. Um, yeah. It's it's the kind of the human struggle. It's the, the the struggle of a living thing against you know its environment, which is just how it goes. And then the fact that we're smart enough to realize that we are really vulnerable when it comes down to it. Um, we're vulnerable on small scales. We're vulnerable on big scales, and it's it's frightening. And so you know, anyway, that's I think a big part of what what this idea of God has to do with is is finding a, a scheme to deal with, with powerlessness or feelings of powerlessness. And so, so you'll deploy nonsense philosophy to defend that if it's challenged, if you have to. And so we have 2,000 years of theology that's just, as you said, exhibiting a clear evolution, which we can also probably map onto the various challenges, other philosophical challenges presented to it. I, I guess with the with regard to infinity again, you know, the conclusion would be either God uh, actually has these sort of infinite um, characteristics, in which case those characteristics are completely abstract and they're only useful in, in, in abstraction. And so therefore God's abstract, in other words, God's incoherent. Or the flip side is God exists but is not... <clears throat> you know, infinite in, in, in the sense that, that many theists would hope for. And God is, is a finite sort of being. And I suppose, you know, in some sense, I, sp I suppose theists could resort to a maximal being, you know, like, like you often hear or, or in perfect being theology and, and the idea of, um, you know, the ontological argument, all these fancy arguments that, that say, well, actually, if we can't have him being, you know, doing these logically crazy things then he just can only do what is logically maximally possible which is I mean it's a beautiful beautiful philosophical argument if you want to play with it and it's very difficult to philosophically undermine except the problem of evil really stands in the way if we have a good God the question comes back could he create or do another good thing and if the answer if he's omnibenevolent and omnipotent then the answer should be yes until there's some level of maximum we'll say that it only goes up to some maximal quantity so we're dealing with a maximal universe then you're stuck with the evidence with which is the world that we live in and yeah. all of a sudden you have to create these arguments that the world that we live in is in fact maximally good which in fact, I've, I've written an article on, uh, on exactly that, like with that conclusion, that this actually has to be, if you're a theist, the best possible world. It literally, you know, it's either, it's either, it, it, God's either, God doesn't know the future, right? So God either has created the best possible ingredients to make a world, but doesn't really know how they're going to turn out, in which case God's not quite as cool as people think or uh, this really is like the best possible outcome or on the way towards the best possible outcome but with a hell of a lot of suffering and shitness on the way so right so this is I mean this is one of the reasons I'm starting to think more and more that uh, philosophy is is a tricky way or maybe not the best way in fact to try to talk about matters where where God is concerned which I think will really upset a lot of people now that I've said that if anybody sees it um, stop saying me <laughs> <laughs> well, there are a lot of interesting philosophical questions and problems to work on, but I don't know that, that God is so much one of them anymore. Uh, but it's like because these things that we're saying, these these arguments seem to be pretty decisively won by non-belief, and the problem is really that we pretend that they aren't because people just keep arguing the other side anyway. Um, often just creating variations on the same old tired, as you said, appeals to ignorance typically. But I would argue that it's circularity more than anything. It's they've assumed, like I said with infinity, we believe, we'll use that word, believe in infinity because we accept, mathematically speaking, the axiom of infinity. People believe in God because they've accepted some axiom of theism, and it's circular. We can't prove infinity exists, we can't prove God exists, 
Well, this is, this is the problem, isn't it? That, that, that we can only prove one thing, right? In the Cartesian sense, I exist, okay? Cognito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. That's all I can know indubitably, right? Everything else has at least a small degree of doubt associated yeah. with it. Uh, and so when you're talking about God, of course, that means you can neither prove nor disprove God, which means that that it comes down to, well, if... if I can believe in God if I really, really want to, uh, because there's no way of disproving God. And so therefore, I really, it, since I really, really want to believe in God, because he does all these cool things for me, like balances my unfair world, acts as a comfort blanket, all those psychological things, and everyone around me, and I'm born and brought up in this kind of crazy atmosphere. And so therefore, you know, it's totally understandable why there are so many religious people. It's a big shame. It is, it is. Um... That's sort of sort of where I'm at with that right now. Uh, where it ties back to infinity again, though, is like I said, the, and this is a rabbit hole as deep as we want to go because we, now we've got to start talking if we want to about what the word truth even means. Yeah. The philosophical truth, you know, would be something that follows from those presumptions. The problem is, just like with infinity, just like with God, we can't establish that the axioms, there, the theistic axioms, whichever brand of theology it happens to be, or uh, the um, axiom of infinity actually map onto the terrain of reality. And so there's sort of this gap. But on the other hand, you know, could we say that it is true that there are infinitely many sizes of infinity, for instance? And yes, that's a truth. What does it mean that it's a truth? It means that under the set of axioms that we accept, usually Zumilla Frankel, um, axioms of set theory, that if we accept that there is an infinite set, which is a um, consequence of the axiom of infinity, then there are infinitely many, necessarily there are infinitely many sizes of infinity larger than that, that than, the, than whatever the smallest one is. And you can't show that there's a smallest one. Um, when we do the same thing with, I think what's going on with theology is doing the same thing with theism. Uh, they accept, or people who believe in God accept some axiomatic construction of God. Um, philosophers often go with some variant, one of them maybe 80,000, no, I'm just kidding, um, eight or nine major variants of classical theism, and then run with that. They start with the axiom and go forward, and that's got inherently the problem of not knowing, not being able to know if that map hooks to the terrain of reality. As it comes out with theism, when you start sticking infin infinite quantities or infinite properties, whether it's actual infinite or qualitative infinite, potential infinite, when you start putting infinite on God, you start getting some big problems because it's, a, it's just a wonderful wellspring of very, very bad ideas that have bad consequences. But that's what faith's for, right? Um, so <laughs> that is what faith does, yeah. I mean, it, faith. I, I don't know why more people don't talk about this when it comes to faith. We, you know, we talked, we've seen all these arguments in the last year or so after Peter Bogosian published his book uh, about what faith means, what faith is, and all this. And you know, Bogosian's argument boils down essentially to the or claim about faith is that it, it is assigning a higher probability to a proposition than it is warranted, than, than evidence warrants, and, you know, filling in that gap. But this is, I mean, this isn't a surprise. People find this to be very, very controversial, but it's not a surprise. It's, it's actually a Catholic dogma that faith has to be accepted Absolutely. Um, well, that always makes me chuckle because basically faith is, uh, you know, absence of evidence is what fills up that justification gap, exactly. isn't it? And and everyone knows this, right? But when Everybody you speak knows. to when you speak to uh, sophisticated theologians or yes. people that people that like to think they know what they're talking about, they say, "Oh no, that's not faith," and and but but they can't really pin down a, a, a coherent idea of what faith is if it isn't that you know and and it's just it's just smoke and mirrors it's just complete bullshit because faith is a justification of a proposition in the absence of, of evidence to do that job exactly yeah. and it is complete justification if you follow the Catholic dogma to say you have faith in something means you assign that by if you follow the Catholic definition of faith as given in the Catechism of Trent, it means that you assign the chance that that statement is you assign a confidence to that statement of one hundred percent. 
There's yeah. no doubt. And so um, I find it, you know, really surprising that this controversy exists. But they do try. I mean, and you said smoke and mirrors. I, I, I'm not nice about it. It is a big magician's game. You know, picture three card Monty or whatever. But it, the game is hide the turd. There is a turd somewhere, and they are trying to hide it somehow by shuffling words around. And that's really what's going on. Smoke and mirrors, if you want, or whatever. And they end up getting dirty hands. Um, so, <laughs> uh, as a as a uh, segue into that, it's pretty useful because uh, I was reading this book. So this is John Loftus's latest uh, uh, part of his sort of big trilogy of of. Of anthologies, this one's Christianity is not great, uh, and actually wrote, read Peter Bogosian's, um chapter today, a nice short chapter, just sort of summarising that exact argument. So, so, uh, but we are both involved in in that book, James, yourself, and my, myself, uh, and we contributed chapters to that. Now, I was a peer reviewer of, you know, we did internal peer reviews since you contributed. You know, I was one of the peer reviewers of, of Peter's chapter, actually, also. Oh, right, right. Well, I was under the opinion that my chapter was the best chapter in the book by a country mile, but, but I did, was re reading on uh, an Amazon review. Someone, I think it was your mum, must have put the, uh, it's a, wrote James A. Lindsay's chapter as the best in the book or something. Complete lie. It is, it is. Um, I, I owe my mom 50 bucks as a matter of fact. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, so are you happy with your chapter? Can you Do you want to just uh, tell us a little bit about what your chapter is, is called and what it's about? Yeah, I think about what it's called now because they changed the title on me after I wrote it. Um, the original title had just been intended to be the subtitle of my first book, which is Only Humans Can Solve Human Challenges, but I think it's something like Only, Only Humans, humans can, solve can Solve the Problems of the World. Of the World, yeah. Um, I mean, th that's the most important thing for, for me, I think, as far as the whole discussion about whether, you know, and I said one of my interests is God's role in society, where it's an interesting thing to talk about because I don't believe there is a God. One of the most important things to take away, and in fact, I had originally come up with the idea to write the God Doesn't We Do book from the angle that what wouldn't exactly be considered atheist. Um, I was going to be ambiguous about that on purpose because I don't think it matters. I think whether people believe in God or whether people don't believe in a God, the conclusion that God isn't doing anything is completely obvious. And so that well, means... It's like prayer in in a medical environment, isn't it? You know, yeah, yeah you can no, pray, but really, you want you want the doctors to be doing their job and science exactly. to be working. Exactly. There, you know, there've been great studies of that, and then there's of course the "you shall not put your God to the test" bullcrap that they use to to you know get around the fact that you know all the evidence mounts up in one direction, which pushes us against or pushes us away from the ability to to believe that there is a, so whether or not there is a God, I think this question really is sort of immaterial. The The ultimate question that matters is, is there a God that does anything? And I think the answer to that question is, is a very clear and resounding no. Um, this is, I believe, the difference between the so-called, you know, everybody argues that Vic Stanger wrote a book about it. Dawkins popularized the idea about the God hypothesis. I think that the God hypothesis makes sense when we talk about whether or not a god does something because that is a in some at some levels that is something that we can test there should be observational things that we can we can do unless we have stupid unfalsifiability clauses thrown in like thou shalt not test your god um, and so we're dealing with a hypothesis at that point you know we have stories in the bible that say such and such happened we can see if those things happen you know god made this happen god made that happen we can do tests of the efficacy of prayer, and we consistently get negative results. And so I think that the chance that the confidence, I really should say, because this would be a Bayesian chance, the confidence to which we can assign uh, God, there is a God that does something in the world as a hypothesis, is very nearly zero, or, or zero almost surely, as a matter of fact. It's completely negligible. It, in any case, whether the, philo whether the philosophy of mathematics parses out that I can say probability zero almost surely with authority or not, I think that the concept holds up that we have gone to not just a very small probability, but a completely negligible probability because all of the evidence that we have points away from accepting such a hypothesis, um, if that makes any sense.
Um, but anyway, the chapter in, in John Loftus' anthology talks mostly to the onus that puts on us as human beings to stop petitioning um, you know, magical beings or even if people think that they're real and not magical, whatever, to stop petitioning for, for God to do things. I know everybody in the universe has kind of fallen out of love with the musician Dave Matthews, but he published a song not so long ago that I don't know how it hasn't become a free thinker's anthem. The song's called Gaucho, and the refrain in the song repeats over and over again. We've got to do much more than believe if we really want to change things. And totally, that's the whole thing yeah. right there. Yeah. Well, I th I, th the whole nature of uh, religious conservatism, of course, is that you don't change things. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I put it. I read it one time, and somebody put it again. I don't know who, so I apologize if, if it gets back to that person. But that conservatism is, the, in, that, in that sense, would be the the view that nobody ever did anything for the first time, and everyone's better off for it. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, what uh, are you still working on? A because you've mentioned uh, psychology quite a bit. Are you? Uh, do you have a project on the go at the moment with, that you want to yeah. say something quickly about? Yeah, I do. I mean, I can't say much about it, but I can mention what's going on. Um, what is it? Is it a secret? What did you say? Why is it a secret? No, is, is it a secret? It's a. Little, it's not terribly secret. Um, a little bit of a, the content is a secret, but the project itself is not a secret. Um, for all of the philosophy and mathematics and, and whatever else, and then my day-to-day -day work that I have to do, my main kind of side reading project for about the last two years has all been psychology of religion, psychology of belief, transpersonal it's psychology. It, it's completely where it's at for me. Uh, psychology of religion is is the cutting edge of, of the arguments for and against religion. It really floats my boat, actually. I get, I get really interested in the psychology of religion. Right, and so I have actually a contract, I even got an advance, to write a book about some of the ideas that I have that have come together off of both the previous two books that I've written combined with these, these things that I've learned about psychology of religion. And so we're hoping for a publication for that next fall. I'm very glad to be working. I should mention explicitly, very glad to be writing that for Pitchstone Press. Um, that's the same publisher that Pete Bogosian used for his manual. It's a small press that does some really good stuff. A lot of their yeah. books are quite good. And yeah. um, that's the main kind of when I'm not doing, you know, jobs or you know, whatever, you know, real life. That's the main thing that I'm, I'm working on right now. And so it hopefully... Sucks. Real life gets in a way of, of, all our, of all our big ideas and, and wonderful ponti pontificating on the world. Doesn't it? Um, but anyway, hopefully, like I said, next fall that should be ready. Um, I've got most of the draft completed now, and I am kind of going through a couple of edits before I start throwing that out to actual editors to see what can happen with it. And then hopefully it will be a, a pretty helpful helpful thing to put out there. Um, I will say that it's completely changed how I think about everything. I have a very difficult time talking about, uh, about almost anything to do with theism now because I see it all a little bit differently. So, in, in, in in what respect? I mean, do you, do you see it as a sort of uh, as a psychological virus? Sometimes you hear this talk uh -huh. about. It has characteristics where that where that makes sense, but it's just seeing it on on different terms. It's seeing theism as, like I said, the belief in God, God being an idea. The the idea the project really comes down to trying to fill in what what's going on with that idea and how it manifests in people. People's do you, experiences. So, do you get a sense of frustration? Do you do you get a sense of like, come on, it's so obviously just an idea and mechanism. When you when you take a stand back and you see the world and all these different beliefs that people have, and you just you just get frustrated that no one can, you know, most of the world just can't get this. I I do now, but I should, to be fair, backtrack to again 2010. 2011 when I was writing God Doesn't We Do and this idea struck me. So if, for, for those of you, for those people out there, if you haven't, I don't know, read God Doesn't We Do, 
the fourth chapter was something that's bothered me was about something that's bothered me going all the way back to early in my teen years that I w I've not ever really been been clear about you know it seems like everybody uses the word God differently and almost like every believer has their own idea and every religion certainly does and so I wrote the fourth chapter of God Doesn't We Do, which the editor of that book said he thought was by far the best chapter in the book, although other people think others are, I guess they prefer others. But that chapter is called Defining God, and it talks about you know the difference between these harder definitions, maybe Yahweh, it's very explicit what Yahweh means, and nobody believes in Yahweh, and then these very soft philosophical definitions all the way down to deism, even brushing into ideas like Taoism, which I studied extensively in my early 20s, uh, there's, there's a great chapter in Loftus's last book, The End of Christianity, on that very thing of talking about how Yahweh, no one believes in Yahweh anymore, and about it's just a completely different God. Sorry, I interrupted. Yeah, no, that's fine, that's fine. That's, that's sort of the idea, but I talked in that chapter about how there's sort of this spectrum of, and I use the phrase, the terms hard and soft for the definitions of God. They're very hard very clear, very, very explicit definitions of what God means, and they're very soft, meaning more philosophical and more abstract definitions of what God means. So back in that time, I guess that would have been early 2011 when I wrote that down, or wrote that chapter, the first draft of it, it struck me for the first time that maybe, just maybe, God is an axiom. Maybe God is just an idea that people assume from the outset and then build a worldview out of it. And when I wrote it down, I felt like I had written maybe the most iconoclastic thing I'd ever thought. And then I told some friends about it, and they told, told me I was ridiculously off, off the path. So I don't think it's obvious in the sense that I now think it's obvious. So when I say, yes, I get frustrated because it seems so apparent to me that God is just an idea or set of ideas that are kind of crammed together, um, I don't think it's obvious in the sense that a lot of people stumble upon it or trust it if they do. It, it seems pretty pretty shocking, or it seemed that way at least to me at first when I first realized that maybe this is just an idea. The idea that God is just an idea was pretty pretty disruptive to my thought process at the time. Um, so anyway, I, yes, obvious, but no, not obvious like super clear everybody should be able to see it I yeah or a little bit of connection and again like I said at the beginning that's where infinity is the, the the book the dot 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 book has been really helpful in clarifying that that line of thought for me because infinity is another example infinity is and it's often tied to God but it's another example of an idea that we accept axiomatically because the axiom seems like it makes sense but it may or may not and probably does not have anything to do with reality whatsoever um, the idea that numbers continue to, in the abstract, continue to be able to have successors, fine. I mean, there's no reason why we couldn't say, oh, you have three, add one, now you have four, add one, now you have five, add one, now you have six, and so on and so forth. The idea that numbers don't ever run out is pretty obvious, but when we start saying, well, what does that mean? That's where it turns out you require a mathematical axiom that not all people accept. Finitists do not accept it. Uh, it's called the axiom of infinity that decides that for the purposes of mathematics we are going to have an actual infinity, an actually infinite set. Um, and I think, like I said, God, I think it's a perfect analogy. It's the tear in, in the matrix that lets us realize we're looking at a map, not at the terrain itself, when we start really, like, why do we, why do we believe things? Why do we think what we think? Why do we see the world the way we do? We have all these assumptions like for instance the assumption which I think is honestly I think this one is um, self-justifying but maybe I'm wrong uh, that the evidence works that's, yeah. that's, an, that's an assumption I think you can you can phrase it in terms of you know two very simple observations two very simple axioms but we have to have them those would be something like I exist and or the world exists and my senses are sometimes right about it that would be two very foundational axioms that would yeah, yeah. So, so the whole you know matrix scenario, uh, Descartes' evil demon. That, that yeah, we we have to take the axiom that the outside world exists because, what? Well, I mean, on on one on one level you could say it's a fifty-fifty. 
and really there is no way of establishing either way whether we live in the matrix or not. On the other on the other hand, you could use the approach of um, there's no good reason to think that we are living in the matrix. So why should I particularly entertain it as being equally probable? You know, there's no. But then I don't know. You, you, yeah, I don't know whether I it's, it's a fifty-fifty or not. You know. So yeah, you take that as an axiom. So yeah, anyway, that's I think the big thrust of dot dot dot, and I think that's what allows it, not necessarily the idea about infinity. Infinity is just kind of a, a tool that, an, an analogy, I guess, that, that makes it a little easier to see um, that the god is probably an assumption more than it is an entity, uh, entirely more than it is an entity. Well, look, mate, um, uh, I, I do uh, ascribe to an axiom of realism, uh, that's that god doesn't exist. Um, <laughs> Uh, but no, congratulations on your book. It's a fantastic book. I advise anyone that might uh, be watching this to uh, buy dot 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 available online from all good retailers and as a as an ebook. So uh, congratulations on that, and look forward to hearing about your new project. And hope hopefully that will come to fruition. Well, it better because if I don't, I have to pay back the advance. So <laughs> <laughs> no, it's going well. It's going really well. Um, and it's going to be very, very interesting to, to put that out there. I wish I could say more about it, but um, I need to need to protect the idea until I've got it completely developed. So, cool. but it's it's a really good one. Good stuff. Good stuff. I don't normally pat myself on my back about my ideas, but this one's a good one. Uh, nice stuff. Well, I look forward. That that just you know whets the appetite for for, for more. So, yeah, look forward to that. Cool. Okay, buddy. We'll um, we'll sign off now. But uh, thank you very much for uh, for uh, the, uh, taking the time to chat to me. Right on. Thanks.